Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 29th Ockham Lecture. It's an immense pleasure to welcome our speaker tonight, Roger Blandford. I first encountered Roger when I was a first-year PhD student. It was my first conference, and we had just sat through a rather ponderous, very prolix, and very inscrutable talk. And then a sonorous voice, we'll hear more of that this evening, boomed through when the chair of the uh, session requested whether there were any questions. The sonorous voice said, I have a comment and a question. It was Roger's comment that enabled me to understand what the preceding talk had all been about. And it was then his penetrating question to the speaker that I contend enabled the speaker to understand what had been about. <laughs> his cameo, I think, encapsulates everything uh, that Roger means to so many of us in this audience here in Oxford and beyond. A piercing physical insight which spans from everything to, uh, from electrodynamics to dynamics to relativity to uh, gravitational lensing, coupled with a strong desire and a very effective way at building up and enriching the community. Roger has recently published with Kip Thorne a massive textbook called Modern Classical Physics. This book distorts space-time. <laughs> it is recommended reading for the intellectually strong as well as the physically strong. <laughs> We're in for a real treat tonight as we welcome Roger to speak to us on uh, the uh, confirmation, conviction and cosmology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, and especially Catherine, for your very kind and generous introduction. And thank you to all of you in Merton College for your gracious hospitality here. I had a wonderful four or five days, and I'll be very sorry to leave on Wednesday. So it has been a joy to be here, and I thank you very much. You even arranged uh, unseasonal weather for me, too. <laughs> These are strange times. The pace of scientific and technological change, which is driven by youthful engineers, entrepreneurs, and enthusiasts, has never been faster. Meanwhile, there's a growing distrust in the very same rational thinking that underlies this change. Much of this disconnect derives from unfamiliarity with what lies under the hood, as they say in the United States. But some originates also in a fear of change. The former represents a serious communication failure for which all parties must share blame, including especially those who seek to profit from ignorance. The latter, this fear, is justified. Understanding and opportunity can be harnessed either to avert or to accelerate existential threat. But the jockey has fallen from the saddle. Tonight, I'm going to ignore this highly sententious introduction and tell you instead about cosmology. <laughs> <laughs> the study of the origin, evolution, and future of the universe at large. A subject that dictionaries associate with both metaphysics and astronomy. However, not quite. Cosmology today is also unrecognizable from 60 years ago largely through the application of technology to grand challenges. Furthermore, our ambition and excitement have sometimes got in the way. We have paid too little attention to the dislocation this progress may cause in societies derived from other belief systems. So tonight, I wish, with the broadest brushstrokes, to explain what has been learned what is knowable soon, and to discuss topics that are likely to remain rooted in metaphysics for a while, without surrendering their fascination. I would also like to explore a few connections to the larger context, touching on the history of ideas, literature, religion, and so on, because I've long believed that such humanizing metaphors 
are vital aids to uh, communication and are capable of actually enhancing the craft of even the most austere and focused scientist. Cosmology has a long and storied history. Few cultures have lacked curiosity about the sky or their creation myths. Scientists have often seen cosmology as a speculative safety valve and do not have a good record until recently. As Lev Landau, you'd like to say, cosmologists are always in error, but never in doubt. <laughs> Theories have been developed with immense conviction and technical ingenuity, and are now completely ignored because their consequences were not confirmed. <clears throat> this is what I meant by my title. A good example is the steady state theory of Hoyle, Bondi and Gold. This was a good idea and it was very popular in Britain, especially in the 50s. I do not know if this was due, as some have suggested, to a world view of an empire on which the sun never sets. In contrast to the revolutionary legends of the Soviet Union and the United States, where Hoyle's big, ironic Big Bang seemed more natural, and which turned out to be correct. So, where is cosmology today? Before I tackle this, I must first explain what is meant by the standard model of the universe, a description that does not and cannot go into too much detail, and only captures the largest scale features. This is why we call it a model. It is also standard in the sense that most practicing cosmologists think it is essentially correct. I said think because they do this in response to so many consequences of the model being validated without serious exception by observation and experimental measurement. Again, this is the confirmation of my title. The think needs to be distinguished from believe. And I'll turn to this in a moment. In fact, there are now so many observations that I cannot begin to explain them all to you in the time available. I can only try to communicate the essence of the model as it stands today. If lead, this leads you, especially the undergraduates here, to seek out and critique the observe, observations, then I will surely have done my job. Perhaps some of you will end up siding with a minority of my colleagues, including at least two from Oxford who take issue with the standard model and whose high outlook I highly respect. This, after all, is the essence of a healthy science. So, the standard model holds sway in the same sense as the standard model of particle physics. It is accepted and validated, but only as far as it goes. When we observe the universe on the largest scale, we are studying both geography and history, because, as you know, light travels at a finite speed. The universe appears to be isotropic, and so far as we can tell, everywhere we can see has had essentially the same history, again, with the broadest brush. We are therefore not special, and the universe, is, as it turns out, as a consequence, is homogeneous when seen at the same time. <clears throat> this principle is rightly associated with Copernicus. You can see here. And, but you can trace back to Aristarchus 300 years before the Common Era who formulated the heliocentric view with the planets and circular orbits about the sun. The stars were affixed to a large star, a large sphere. Aristotle replaced the circle with sphere centered on the Earth, which was a step backwards, and found four and eventually five elements which he, which he introduced, well they're not solely him. And a lot of belief was introduced at this point to supplement his observation. This is an extreme version of the conviction of my title, 
And this example did well for 18 centuries. However, as most of you know, Johannes Kepler used Tycho Brahe's observations to confirm the heliocentric view and confirm his conjecture that the orbits of the planets were ellipses. So much for conviction. There was an important next step that is not quite so well known, and that was taken by the unfortunate Bruno in Italy, and more parochially, an English astronomer who is not so well known, called Thomas Dix. He translated and popularized Copernicus's work, and he saw the stars as extending through an infinite space. He was almost certainly the first person to recognize that this implied that any line of sight should eventually intercept a star, and so the night sky should be bright. Let me give you a side story here. Again, I'm trying to connect to a larger culture for a purpose. Diggs died in 1595, and his widow Anne had moved to Stratford by the time William Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. And Hamlet is replete with astronomical imagery. For in example, he says, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself the king of infinite space. He says this to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. These, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, are the names of Tycho Brahe's cousins acknowledged in the introduction to the Starry Messenger. Anne's second husband was Shakespeare's executor. Such facts, and these are facts, and beyond that is speculation, but they might inform suggestions that the Earl of Oxford wrote the plays because only someone with such a high education and birth could have done such a thing. Also, he would have had to have done them posthumously. <laughs> End of story. So let's return to the universe. We have known for almost a century, thanks to Leifer and Hubble, that it is expanding in a uniform way, so that the local <coughs> recession velocity increases with distance. Here is Hubble's original plot with velocity measured, as you'll notice here, first-year students, in kilometers. <laughs> this expansion, though, does expand, does explain, excuse me, the bright sky problem, the bright night sky problem. Because ultimately, as, we be soon, as people soon realize, the distant receding stars would appear dim due to their Doppler shift, or equivalently redshift. It also, simply by taking the slope of this curve and taking its reciprocal, enables us to estimate the age of the universe. Now, the number that Hubble actually got for astronomical reasons was wildly different from the contemporary number, but the principle was correct. And using modern theory, the age is now calculated as 13.8 billion or equivalently giga years. And that is and people are arguing about the final significant figure. The best measurement to date claims an accuracy in this. That, as I say, it's about 1% or so. However, there are other astronomical techniques that are used to give estimates of a younger universe that is as much as 10% smaller. <laughs> Nothing that I have to say in this talk will be seriously influenced by that. And my suspicion, frankly, and I say this as a member of one of the teams that has produced other values eventually, is that the number I gave you is probably pretty close to correct. But this is a belief. We will find out by measurement. What is important is that it is not so long ago that we were arguing about a factor of two or more difference in the age of the universe in comparatively recent years, with, if for many people, fussing about a few percent, and for all, some people who have serious opinions, 10 as much as 10%. So this is enormous progress, as I hope you can appreciate. So, the universe is expanding, a bit like a 3D balloon. 
as this expansion is what we are effectively looking at, it actually makes more sense to consider the size of the universe instead of the eight time in the universe as being the variable that we use to say how far it has expanded in the past or, in, or indeed in the future. And we do this typically by introducing what's a quantity called the scale factor. And if we smooth out the universe and imagine it as just expanding, as I say, like a three-dimensional balloon, then the scale factor is the size of that balloon, or the difference between any two galaxies, for example, divided by their separation today, or the size of the balloon today. So the universe was half as big when this scale factor, I'll call it A if you like, was a half. And that's a good way to think about it, and you can see schematically here. And as we look back in time, we are looking to smaller values of the scale factor. In addition, the light, which has a wavelength, that wavelength will expand in proportion to the scale factor. If we put a wave on a balloon, blow up the balloon, the wavelength will increase with the radius of the balloon. And that's just what happens to light as it propagates through this universe. And so, if a spectral line emitted by hydrogen atoms, as indeed they do, with a wavelength of 21 centimeters, is observed when A was a half, 0.5, then today we will see it with a wavelength of 42 centimeters. And that's how we learn a lot, and this is why it is helpful to think about the size of the universe as a measure of how far it is expanding. So far, I have talked about space and time. This is called kinematics, and is what Gal Galileo is famous for having considered. Galileo, as a young man, was a follower of Aristotle, a scholastic. And he argued quite cleverly that if I dropped something like this, its speed would increase in proportion to distance. He famously made measurements to test his conviction, although he may not have dropped a cannonball off the Tower of Pisa. He famously discovered that instead the speed increased with time. And it is known, and he is known, I think, a little unfairly, as the father of experimental science. This is unfair because some of William of Ockham's contemporaries, not to mention the Arabs and Greeks, whose sources they were reading avidly, they had also understood this in their way. And similar approaches developed in the, quite independently in China and India and elsewhere. So with Galileo and, Leo and Kepler sorting out the kinematics, it fell to Isaac Newton to explain what was meant by a force, and to sort out the dynamics. Here is Wollstone, when Newton related the force of gravity that made the moon accelerate to what dropped the apple. Now you may know that this was the place where Newton worked, because if you look carefully, you can see the integral signs that he carved <laughs> in the wall. Actually, that's a rather cruel joke because the integral sign was introduced by his bitter rival Leibniz. I boast that I was born four miles away from Walsthor, but my students are totally, totally unimpressed. Anyway, Newton explained that force was proportional to acceleration, and using the inverse square law, as you know, he recovered elliptical orbits as shown on the back of this old one pound pan note, which has the sun helpfully depicted at the center of the ellipse. <laughs> no wonder they discontinued it. Anyway, this Newtonian view, augmented by clever calculational techniques, nowadays and soon based upon energy more than the force, which Newton thought in terms of, they have never failed when used appropriately 
And to this day, this remains the basis of most engineering. And its principles have been abundantly confirmed. Most physicists, consequently, developed the conviction that this would always be the case. Galileo and Newton also explained that the moon, an apple and a coin, would follow the same orbit if they started at the same time and place with the same velocity. And they thought this curious, as indeed did Albert Einstein. He developed a completely different physical model called general relativity. It was space and time instead of being different as they were for Newton, are physically united as space-time. And this space-time is curved by all the stuff in the universe. So that the moon and a sixpence follow straight lines. And it almost exactly looks exact to us the same as if Newton's forces were at work. The best exceptions and differences between Newton's viewpoint and, um, and Einstein's viewpoint occur when speeds approach, sometimes quite slowly, the speed of light. And there are now many experiments which have tested general relativity, and so far it has never failed. In particular, it predicts the radiation of gravitational waves, which you have seen there. And uh, it has been validated uh, quantitatively to better, in some cases, than 50 parts per, per million. And in the case of these uh, detections of gravitational waves uh, by LIGO and Virgo, the theory is validated, but nothing to like that precision as yet, in the strong gravity limit, which is very big, very different from doing it when gravity is weak. So we have ample reasons for trusting the general theory of relativity. In a related fashion, under relativity, mass, which is the quantity of matter, is related to energy through what is argued to be the best known equation from physics. So I won't say it, and it is more useful to think in practice as it is with Newtonian mechanics, in terms of energies more than it is in terms of forces. However, given their experience with relativity emerging as a distinct expression of gravity, one that gives different and validate or confirmed, I should say, measurements from Newtonian theory, physicists have had at least had a healthy caution that general relativity should also apply to cosmology. So instead, they have adopted general relativity very much as the working model, and they are alert to the possibilities that it could fail. So far, with one possible qualification which I will discuss, general relativity does very well indeed, and we have no cause for doubt. The equations that are necessary, which I, as you are physicists, so I have to write down differential equations for you, here are two differential equations, and if you stare at this for a moment, it might remind you of Newtonian energy conservation. This one in turn, might remind you of the first law of thermodynamics, where the change in the internal energy is related to the work that is done. In this case, this is real. In that case, it is purely spurious. It is not spurious, but it is um, that it works out this way is a pure coincidence, and you really need general relativity to be able to cast it in this form. So this is the time, that is the scale factor, that you know is Newton's constant, and here is the density of mass energy, if you like. Now you might say, well, if it were an energy equation, what should be on the right-hand side of this equation? And it turns out, and here's one of the relativity features of this that Newton and his followers can say nothing about, that that quantity there is, is there 
as is related to the curvature, not of space-time, but of the cosmological space itself. And so that quantity on the right-hand side is just a measure of spatial curvature, and that has, could have been there. Many of us thought it should be there for a while on the basis of observations. It's now been measured extremely well, and it seems to be very close to zero. So I have set it to zero. That, of course, makes it a bit simpler, but it could, in principle, be there. So that gives you some idea of what is going on in this business. Okay, and this is what we need, really, all we need to describe the universe at large and its expansion. So it's not as threatening as it might seem. So let's look at the universe today. Let's look at the universe and its contents. In our chauvinist way, we will start with regular matter, the stuff of you and I. Atoms, molecules, plasma. We call this baryons. And we now know that only 5% of the total average mass energy density of the universe is in this form. We can measure how much there is. The protons, on average throughout the universe, are about two meters apart. Two arms like that. That's on average. Interestingly, and again another side note, the first person to attempt this calculation or estimate was Archimedes. I showed you a picture of before. A close follower of Aristarchus, who certainly knew and fully accepted the heliocentric theory. In the Sand Reckoner, which incidentally was probably read by Copernicus, so he wasn't completely working from nowhere, Archimedes argued that the universe is equivalent to, in exponential notation, 10 to the 63 grains of sand. Now, I have reason to believe that the old Eureka Streaker knew how to relate volume to mass. And so this, in simple arithmetic, is equivalent to 3 times 10 to the 52 kilograms. The modern calculation of the baryon mass of the observable universe is just 3 times larger than that. Good enough for government work. <laughs> I'm not saying that had Archimedes not been slain by a clueless Roman soldier, he would have gone on to derive, he would have used his calculus, I should say, to derive the field equations of general relativity. What I've just presented to you is a lucky coincidence. And if I'd have told you that Archimedes' universe was only six light years across, actually 12 light years across, I take it back, um, uh, you would not have been so impressed. However, what is important is not sort of finding acute coincidences, it's that there is a clear intellectual thread all the way back to 300 years BC. We see, I say, say paradise. And there are these intellectual threads connect contemporary views with selected features of ancient academic and religious traditions. We should not be afraid of these. The next constituent after the baryons is called dark matter. Evidence for it was first found in the 1930s by Jan Oort from Holland and Fritz Wicke, both of whom had the privilege to meet. We now know that this dark matter has just over five times the density of the baryons. Various ideas about its Identity and its provenance have been explored experimentally. But it has, there is no evidence, it has not been found, it has not been identified, and there is no evidence that it has any of the interactions of the other particles. It has proved as elusive, and I have to say this here, as macavity, and it cannot be convicted. Unlike said cat, though, it does appear to obey the law of gravity. In particular, a galaxy should be thought of as a large gravitational potential well formed by dark matter with a smaller central puddle of light-emitting baryons. As Eliot also said, 
between the motion and the act lies the shadow. You also see dark matter in clusters of galaxies. And here we see the dark matter in blue, separated from the baryons in red because they do not interact. Baryons, of course, interact with themselves. It's gas. The dark matter keeps on going. These giant clusters of galaxies are again great measures for astronomers to explore dark matter, but we cannot say what it is. This quest for its identity has been carried out below ground in mines, on ground at particle accelerators, and above ground with gamma ray telescopes. This is an enormous, large enterprise, and its failure is anything but this. All of these approaches are experimental physics at their finest. Please see me afterwards if you have any better ideas. My third constituent is the neutrinos. Again, we only infer their presence. However, we know their properties and that they come in three flavors. We know that they have very small masses and cosmology is being combined with the laboratory experiments to measure their, their masses and their properties. Today, they account for less than a fraction of a percent of the universe, but in the past, they were important. The fourth component is radiation, and although its mass contribution today is negligible, it too was dominant in the past, and it is well worth dwelling on because in practice the radiation has told us more than half of what we know about the universe at large today. We see it mostly as the cosmic microwave background radiation. It has a three degree temperature and it was discovered by accident by Penzias and Wilson in 1964. Its central wavelength is about one millimeter. Here is a spectrum for those of you who know what black body radiation is. It's a very good black body, better than it's easy to make in the laboratory. And most of it, come, most of this black body radiation comes to us from a time when the universe was a thousand times smaller. And its wavelength was consequently one micron, not one millimeter. So it was like at that time being in the atmosphere of a red star like Betelgeuse. At this time, when it propagated to us, the baryons were just changing from an ionized plasma with electrons freed from protons to hydrogen atoms. This is called, rather unfortunately, but inevitably, recombination. At this point, you should be asking, how did the giant clusters of galaxies come to be? The answer is that tiny departures from uniformity about 10 parts per million in the density of dark matter at this time of recombination grew subsequently under gravity to make the structures we see around us today. If we look back, we can map out, as you have done here, this is the whole sky. And blue is hot and red is cold. And you see these tiny 10 parts per million fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background on time, tinier scales actually than is exhibited here. Studying the correlations of these fluctuations, which depends upon very basic and simple physics, nothing, sim nothing complicated or highfalutin, just basic and simple physics, much of it derived from the 19th century, has taught us so much, and it continues to do so. In particular, Looking at correlations on different angular scales, and that's just shown here, I can't possibly explain to you what's going on, just say this is different angular scales. Looking at the correlations here, you can fit it by a model, and you see all the points here, you see them lying on the curves, these are polarization, that's the total intensity of the radiation. You can see 10 of these peaks here, large error bars here, are simply because we only have one universe to look at, so we don't have much sampling. This is very strong confirmation, just six numbers 
are able to reduce this. William of Ockham, I think, would smile on this figure. I now turn to the final component. This accounts for 69% of the universe today. I will call it the cosmological constant, though you will often, and I actually believe, unfortunately, hear it referred to as dark energy. The cosmological constant was actually introduced by Einstein in 1917 for a very good reason. It is one described by one single number. It represents an energy density that has the same value everywhere and always. <clears throat> and it is also the same if we move through it with a high speed closer to that of light. This makes it special. We can think of it as an essential part of the general relativity equation whose consequences I showed you, showed you in the last equation for the scale factor. And the cosmological constant, if you see it in this light, as part of this equation, confers a scale to the equation in much the same way the Planck's constant confers a scale to the Schrodinger equation. Alternatively, we can think about the cosmological constant just as more stuff to create space-time curvature and source gravitation. If we take the second approach rather than the first, then the stuff has what seem like unfamiliar properties. It has negative pressure, that's a sort of tension, equal and opposite to its energy density. People seem disturbed by this, but there is actually a very good precedent for it. The first year students may not appreciate, but others will, I hope, that if I were to take a uniform magnetic field here with the symbol B and have it inside a piston, inside a cylinder with a piston here, there is a magnetic tension there and there's an energy density. And as I withdraw that piston, of course, you might say nothing is changing, but the increase of the energy is the work done by the piston because the pressure is the negative of the energy density. This is classical electromagnetism. There is nothing funny there. The only thing that's different in a cosmological constant when viewed as stuff rather than an essential part of relativity, the only thing that is different is that it's in, three, in all three dimensions rather than just in one dimension, so this with a magnetic field. The history of this is a little instructive. Einstein used it to make a static model of the universe. This turned out to be unstable, and in reaction to this, he rejected the cosmological constant. However, others realized that it could be part of an expanding universe and cause it to accelerate. And this is how it was first detected. Another Catholic priest, Georges Lemaitre, with extraordinary and consistent prescience, took the cosmological constant very seriously and said, and I emphasize this in 1933, that the expansion thus took place in three phrase, phases. A first period of rapid expansion in which the atom universe, that was his phrase at that time, was broken into atomic stars, a, a period of slowing down followed by a third period of accelerated expansion. This he said in 1933, we're changing the atoms to something slightly more contemporary. That's how we see it today. Eddington had even stronger, Eddington, that this gentleman here, you've probably heard of him, had even stronger convictions in the same year. I would as soon think of reversing, of reverting to Newton, I, I would as soon think of reverting to Newtonian theory as of dropping the cosmical constant, it's all cosmical constant at that time. To drop the cosmical constant would knock the bottom out of space. There was conviction there. 
In his 1951 textbook, which is my first source on cosmology, Bondi wrote down and solved the equations that we use today to describe the standard model of cosmology. In my first formal instruction, the cosmological constant was always present as a quantity to be measured without prejudice. However, in the 1980s, when particle theorists discovered cosmology, they mostly found the cosmological constant to be repugnant. Because, this is a good reason, its natural value was 10 to the exponent of 123 times larger than what you might read what it seemed to be, if it were there. And so they reasoned, I think sensibly, that some symmetry should render it zero. This raises a somewhat interesting point. Underlying the concern of the particle physicists was a conviction that all physics is ultimately derivable from the smallest scale. It is true there are emergent phenomena, like ferromagnetism, for example, but this, the spin behavior that this depends upon has the, relies on the properties of electrons and nuclei, which depend on quarks and gluons and all the rest of it. So it is ultimately a reductionist theory. We say call this reductionism, and this is a reductionist theory. <coughs> Most particle physicists, in my experience, have a strong conviction that all physics is reductionist, not what we know about so far. In particular, they believe that gravity must ultimately yield to the prerogatives of quantum mechanics. Now, I have no, no objection to this conviction, but contrary-wise, I have never seen it as necessary. The square peg of quantum field theory need not be hammered into the round hole of general relativity. Perhaps the cosmological constant is our first glimpse of physics on the very largest scale, just like black body radiation, specific heats and the thermoelectric effect revealed the world of the small. Consider, allegorically, a bug in a still pond. A fish swims by, and the bug finds itself in the fish's turbulent wake. It observes that its food is moving with an average speed that increases the cube root of its distance. It's an intelligent bug, and it does kinematics. Now, if this bug wishes, desires to reconcile its observations with their causes, it is to the outer scale of the turbulent spectrum that's on the size of the fish that it should turn, not to the properties of water molecules. Allow me a second analogy. Imagine a sailor climbing a mast <coughs> on a boat in the middle of the ocean. There is water as far as he can see, perhaps 10 miles. Yet he knows that the world is large and curved, and this large world is the source of the gravity and the weather. Could something similar to this be actually occurring in cosmology? And the cosmological constant is an expression of the large scale, not the small. It's time to take stock. I have described to you that the modern universe has five major ingredients that in some whimsical way have replaced the same number of Aristotelian elements. The earth, the water, the air, the fire, and what is variously called the ether or sometimes quintessence, the fifth element. Here are the modern elements on a pie chart. They are all we really need, plus the principles of physics that we think we understand, to reconstruct the history as far back as we are confident in the physics. I like, I like to describe this history, and here I know that I have to show some graphs or some equations. I've tried to keep it out of this talk of the physicists. This is their meat and potatoes. Let's look at this curve here, which shows the expansion of the universe. And I like to describe it in sort of seven ages, seven phases. 
And I'm going to start at the time when element, everything is so hot, elementary particles are what I, you notice most. I call this PA, it's the particle era. The scale factor is 10 to the minus 11, which is quite advanced compared with modern theory, which goes back a long way over there. The density, of course, is much greater than it is to, today. In fact, it's going to be over there, except at the moment. These are the different constituents of the universe, baryons, photons, and so on. Don't worry about the details and so on. Just understand that there is a story of physics being told here. Here's the cosmological constant with its character, common symbol lambda. Negligible down here, but at late times it's going to start becoming important. As the universe expanded from this earlier particle age, it will pass through a nuclear age. And yet now, students nowadays do not learn any nuclear physics, but if you were to learn any nuclear physics, you would quickly see this as the origin of all of the chart of the nuclides, all the way up to helium. And so all of the rest of the nuclei are formed in stars later, but the hydrogen, the helium, the deuterium, they are formed in this epoch. And quantitatively, what it comes out of this is exactly what is measured. During the next era, the, uh, the radiation era, the universe is expanded in a way that's controlled by the photons. The dark and the baryonic matter eventually took charge during this, this brief plasma age, which ended at this recombination when the universe became transparent and atomic hydrogen was formed. At this point, the age of the universe, as you can read off here, was 380,000 years. Next came the atomic age, when the first stru structures in the universe started to form under gravity. These can be observed as young stars, galaxies, and quasars. <coughs> in ways that we do not understand, they were able to reionize another misuse of language, the gas outside the galaxies, make the atoms into plasma again, and this has a profound influence on how the majority of galaxies, including our own, were formed in the gravitational age. Finally, we have the cosmological age, when the cosmological constant became dominant, comparatively recently in this sense. Going forward, we can look forward to an exponential expansion featuring dilution and decay, an agoraphobic's worst nightmare. The story that I have told you is compelling and has been well confirmed by measurement and observation. However, it raises a second interesting question, just like the dark night sky. I said that the universe was a few milliseconds old at the start of the particle age. As you know, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light except, perhaps, a, a rumour. This is allowed because it carries no information. <laughs> there was no time at the start of the particle age when the universe we observe today, there was no time to homogeneous, there was no time of getting the different parts to be in contact and become smooth. And this problem gets worse as we go back in time. How come the universe is so homogeneous today. The answer to this riddle may be that the universe started off as homogeneous on a scale that encompasses all that we see today, but then it underwent a period of rapid exponential cosmological constant-like expansion. So that the homogeneous universe got out of causal contact with itself, despite being homogeneous, and then, at much later times, came back into our view. This first epoch is known, as many of you realize, by the name inflation, and after it ended was when the bits that have gone away, like undergraduates leaving their parents, they go home when they run out of money, and um, they come back across the horizon, and uh, this sort of hello, goodbye, hello story is the one that most people argue is responsible for the homogeneous universe of today. 
The simplest models, it's conviction if you like, but the simplest models have consequences which have been confirmed by direct measurement. In particular, there's a generic expectation that the fluctuations that are responsible for the structure of the universe are almost equally strong on all scales and have random phases. Again, this appears to be the case. The universe began with a hum, not a fanfare. However, I'll defer to Eliot's authority on how it will end, perhaps with a pathetic whimper. So what I've described so far is this standard model of cosmology. Most of it depends on known physical laws and the simplest assumptions about processes that we do not completely understand. So far, like general relativity itself, it has been pretty well confirmed. However, there's still much work to be done on major questions. How did inflation end? What is dark matter? And why did it have just the density we measure today? Likewise, how did the baryons form? And why is there an excess of them over antibaryons? What happened before inflation began? What lies beyond our current horizon? The answers to these questions are unknown, but they do seem to require some special pleading. This realization has led many cosmologists to contemplate the existence of a multiverse, an ensemble of universes either real or imagined that exhibited all the possible properties and features that could be imagined. Some formulations of string theory argue for 10 to the power 500 vacua to be considered. The initial conditions may vary, so might the physical laws. Some extreme versions of this line of reasoning vary the laws of arithmetic and logic. Not sure what William of Ockham would have made of that. So the answer to the question, why are we here, becomes the principle that our very existence selects the only combination of features that allows life as we perceive it to begin, to develop, and to survive. This is called the anthropic principle. Instead of our usual view of causality, which we may characterize as things are as they are because they were as they were, we have now things were as they were because we are as we are. <laughs> Many physicists find this viewpoint abhorrent, a renunciation of their craft and a descent into metaphysics. By contrast, others see it as an inevitable contribution, sorry, an inevitable continuation of the methodology of physical reasoning, as it is metamorpho metamorphosed from the billiard table through Bayesian inference that is appropriate <coughs> when you have much data, but hypothesis testing experiments are impossible and on from there to foundational questions where the problems are real but the facts are few and you must ascend into metaphysics for enlightenment. Again, it is all too easy to recall the earnest discourses involving Roger Bacon appealing to experiment, William of Ockham saying just keep it simple and to Thomas Aquinas trying to do the fundamental thing like many physicists did today and divine God's purpose. This was all conducted at a time of large <coughs> political and social change, just like today. So, in this talk, I've tried to present a view of how far cosmology has travelled as a discipline over the past 60 years. Just as the outcomes for the hearty sailors of the 15th and 16th centuries had some precedence, they were on voyages of discovery that could have had quite different outcomes. From a scientific perspective, it has all been a glorious success. But where is it headed? There are still many places on a crowded street where the apple cart can be overturned. And I personally 
hope this actually happens. But if it does not, then my guess, not even the conviction, is that cosmology will make some limited, though not widely accepted, contribution to our understanding of the properties of neutrinos, that the eschatological expectations of a cosmological constant and the causal consequences of the basic inflation <coughs> mechanism will be borne out, and that the great metaphysical questions will be addressed in a more philosophically responsible fashion, but hardly answered. As additional insight will probably be rather hard to acquire. Instead, in my view, it is the more prosaic and pragmatic investigations that I see making a lot of progress. As Peter Medawar, someone who had a big influence on me when I read his books as an undergraduate, said, science is the art of the soluble. One example is making a map of the entire universe we actually inhabit, not some statistical version of it. It will initially be crude. Here is an attempt that my colleagues and I have actually made, a model, three-dimensional model of the current universe. But eventually, it will be filled in with more detail. In addition, filling in large gaps in the narrative history of the first galaxies, stars, and planets will, like the paleontologists of the 19th century, lead to great progress and understanding, and the telescopes are coming that should do that. Discovering new denizens of the universe and <coughs> allowing us to develop a far more sophisticated view of the singularity or ubiquity of life will also be a challenge, and one that will probably be met. Allow me to return to the viewpoint with which I started. The cosmology story has widespread appeal, and it can be presented in a fashion that connects strongly to earlier and different traditions without treading on political or religious bunions. It is a splendid exemplar of much modern science as is actually practiced, where humans advance as much through failing fast as they do through technique and insight. Where conviction is fine, but must eventually see to confirmation, and where absolute certainty may often lie over the horizon. To the undergraduates here, I implore you to learn what you can and to experiment in communicating it to as wide an audience as you can access. Perhaps in this way we can honour the memory of William of Ockham and do our small part in recovering rational choice and technical innovation as the means to address existential threat on a complicated planet. I thank you very much for your patience. Now that you've heard uh, the entire history of the world played in front of you, I'm full for questions. Please. Uh, so you mentioned that quantum field theorists they try to come up with some kind of estimate from first principles of um, the cosmological constant lambda, right? Yes. So could, could you just briefly explain the actual calculation that they do or what, what they're doing? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is an enormous field. Um, basically, <coughs> the, if you ask what is the cosmological constant you will get in Planck units, it is 123 orders of magnitude larger than the actual one that has been measured. That's the first problem. So what you have to do is to find some cunning way to suppress the vacuum having an energy density that's of that magnitude. And there are countless devices, the quantum field theorists, 
who care deeply about this have explored and they use this as a constraint, if you like, on their non-cosmological quest for a theory of quantum gravity, which may or may not be based on string theory. Usually it is, but not always. And so there are, I won't say 10 to the 500 papers, but there are probably 10 to the 3 papers on precisely the question you raise, and they're all clever and distinct ways of suppressing a vacuum energy density that is as large as I said, and making it close to zero, getting that number, the 10 to the minus 123 in Planck units, I know of no com compelling and um, communicable, communicable way of doing that. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned the um, tension between some of the different cosmological experiments of their measurements of H0, for example. Um, so how do you think we're going to disentangle which one is right, and what do you think the reason for the discrepancy between the different um, experiments are? There is a, they call it a tension, there's a tension there. The simplest way out is to say, well, you really need a five sigma discrepancy before you take it seriously, and this is just a distribution of outcomes, and that will work out to be the same. I don't really think that that's right. I think there is a, a genuine Hubble constant that, it, that it, it's as simple as we have, I have portrayed it, and my guess, and this, this is not even a conviction, my guess is that the value measured essentially by the microwave background will be the right one. I'm you know, going to say this, but I, you know, the other methods may well turn out to be right. The basic problem with some but not all of the other methods is that they depend on what's called a cosmic distance ladder. So. Um, I measure the distance from my eyes to my spectacles and then as a ratio I measure the distance from my spectacles to you and by if I know the distance to my spectacles then I have a good measurement of the distance to you but if I don't have that measurement or there's an error there, there's a, what we call a systematic error then the, the distance to you will be wrong, the Hubble constant will be wrong <clears throat> now, there's one important possibility which, again, many people have taken seriously. For my part, I don't yet take it seriously, though I'd love it to be the case. And that is that many of these discrepant measurements, not all of them, not in fact the one I was sort of half I was associated with, yeah, I'm proud to be, um, many of those are measuring the expansion locally. It's just in our neighborhood, they're measuring how fast things are expanding. The, co the Planck measurement of the microwave background is looking out to when the universe is one thousandth of its present size. It's a distant measurement. I use the theory that connects the local to the distant because it just believed on general relativity and the simple constituents of the universe. If there's extra physics coming in there, then I can get anything I want, including two discrepant Hubble constants. So that is another way out, which many have seized upon. I see no need for that as yet, and I, I, know, I have enough respect for and appreciate the difficulties of doing these measurements that I suspect Ultimately, they will be reconciled, and it won't take a lot. Won't take a very long time, I believe. You know, we're talking about three, four, five years, or something like that, before they eventually become sort of reconciled. And the reason why, for example, Hubble, he got 540 rather than 68. That's a huge error, huge mistake. But the reason why it turned out teaching us a lot about stars that. There was a confusion about the type of stars we're using. So when reconciling what Hubble got with what we get today, a large part of that change was taught us a lot about stars. And so I think we will learn something about galaxies properly, maybe about stars,
from this reconciliation. So it, it, it will happen. That's my, that is my belief, which, as I say, is less than the conviction, which is certainly less than the confirmation. Does that help? No, obviously not. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for a fascinating talk. I, I just want to push the question of the cosmological constant again. Yes. Um, obviously, if the cosmological constant is a constant of nature, like big G or H, yes. one would expect it to be constant all the way back. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, Dirac famously did question whether these, co these dimensional yes. constants were. But anyway, but if it has that state, it's okay, expect it to be constant all the way back. But if it is the result of some cancellation and zero point energies and so forth, some symmetry that we haven't quite understood, you might expect it to be different, take on different values and different ages. So, my question to you is uh, to what extent do we really have evidence for the constancy of the cosmological constant? Um, we, we do. Um, okay, so let me go into dark energy territory. Um, wearing my hat, not, not as an observational astronomer, but as a theorist, the cosmological constant, like general <coughs> relativity, is special. The reason I gave, it, it, uh, is, if it is a constant, it appears in a symmetric way with no preferred frames in general relativity. A more general theory inevitably defines a preferred frame and has lots of other speciality associated with it. I personally find that suspicious. I'm suspicious that that is the way the world is. But this is we're not even we're a belief at this stage. Okay, so that's why I personally think it's a, a single constant. You know, if you told me that Planck's, Planck's constant, you know, if you, you had some problem in doing atomic or molecular physics, and you say, well, Planck's <coughs> constant is different in, for carbon and for oxygen, and that explains why I can't do my sums, or get the measurements right or something. You know, you'd be, you'd be a bit suspicious of that. And it's the same thing here, really. So that, that's why I, I personally believe it's constant. But the formalism has been set up and embraced it by observers and large teams to describe not an equation of state where the pressure is equal to minus rho, the energy density, but to generalize it P equals W rho, where W is equal to minus one for a cosmological constant. This is in the stuff rather than the, you know, the general relativity equation version of the theory. And then to go off and measure W. And the more ambitious and hardy of this group go off and measure its derivative with respect to log A and so on and so forth. Now those measurements have gone from W apparently being negative when a bit nervous and so on, to being arguably, with some would say, two, three, four, five, six, seven percent, depending on quite how you cast this, of minus one. So we're it's certainly smaller than minus 0.9, and some would say it's within a few percent of minus one. So. That is the formalism that is being used by a large number of observational teams to measure, using a variety of clever astronomical techniques, the actual value from the kinematics of the expansion of the universe. And so we'll see, you know, over the next, here are the results coming in all the time, and it'll just get gradually better and better and better. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which some of you may have known, is the one that promises to produce the best measurements. In that, they'll come in in about a decade. Um, I, I didn't quite understand your reply, but um, I didn't. I especially didn't understand what you said about the pre, no preferred frame. So it's a constant in front of the metric. So suppose you compare it with the scalar curvature or something. So that's a number that has no preferred frame that we believe changes with time, right? So what is it about the cosmological constant having no preferred frame? Well, you can I mean, put other that. things in that are, right. in Einstein's language, generally covariant. 
right. into the field equation. There's a large, you know, the so-called F of R theories are examples of that. You can do that. What I, I you call me fashion, I think correctly. What I really was thinking or saying was that if you have the P equals m m uh, W rho formalism, then that defines a preferred frame. And so the actual thing that's being tested by these observational programs is one with a preferred frame. Now, you can have other theories of gravitism. I said the most, you know, there's famous, there are lots of them out there, there's no shortage, but the most best developed are the so called F of R theories. And those, you know, Einstein would approve of those. And, you know, and they're worth testing, not just in cosmology, you test them, mm. in fact, more usefully in other environments. But I, I'm sorry, I'm being very slow, but how does this relate to the constancy of the cosmological constant? I didn't think. Well, it, it could, it could have, uh, if it's going to, going to vary, well, you've got, if you regard it as stuff, right. then if you take the first law of thermodynamics, then if you want it to change with time, then you've got to have something other than P equals minus rho. Uh -huh. That's, how it, that's how it depends. Now, again, you can follow some different route, but you're starting to get pretty broke at that point. Can I just use the chairman's uh, prerogative to uh, ask another question to you and try to lower the intellectual level of the, uh, of, 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 of the conversation? <laughs> so, so you had a slide where you showed the multiverse, and that looked like this, this sort of a set of bubbles connected by a kind of tentacles, uh, right? So, so, so that that represented these, these many universes. What do the tentacles represent in that slide? <laughs> it's me. You should ask Andre Linde, um, who created it, and has got much mileage out of it. I mean, I think what is, there was something that was more, it's quite an old slide, but it's, it's just meant to be figurative, no more than that. Well, are they born out of each other? Yes. Is there well, supposed to be some kind of connection? There what, are, is, what is that? Because I thought that there's not supposed to be any connection between them. Oh, is there? Well, think hello, goodbye, hello. What happened at uh -huh. the early times? I mean, there are many metaphysical views. Some will say that come back, oil, gold, and bondy, all was forgiven, you were right all along, we live in the eternal universe, and it keeps on budding off new universes, most of them, all, essentially all of them, are still born, and would certainly not create a uh, professor of plasma physics, and, but the one that we inhabit has done that, because professors of plasma physics are fusionizing it and we're putting a condition but they, on the nature of the universe. The and tunnel. most of them are still born. But yes, but but they, they, can't, can, they can't tunnel through those tentacles, can they? So yes, I, I, no, I'm no. trying to establish what that connection is. Uh, it's uh, quite, no, it's, uh, and there are many, th there are not quite as many theories of inflation as quantum gravity, but it's getting up there. And mm -hmm. so there must be there's probably a you know, hundred different ways of thinking about these essentially metaphysical questions um, as to how, what happened before the start of inflation. Is it just one-off expansion, which the clock was set going and everyone's up and running, or where there, is there a plenum of universes out there which new ones are budding off all the time and Essentially, all of them uh, are still born or lead, lead to totally different consequences, and a set of almost a measure almost zero is left behind, looked at from the, you know from the a priori way, to be us. But it's the one we know and love, and therefore we have selected that one. This is this is the argument and. If you find this extremely disturbing and in denial of what you thought science was about, I won't say you're right, but I will say you have distinguished company. Oh, I'm, I'm just very tempted to, to uh, work to uh, 
use the Occam razor on this one. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's 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 a that's a very wise and sensible point. Uh, so I believe you can learn a lot from looking at relational weights, from inflation, and so on. Now, how far can you look back in principle if you had these relational probes? If you could, if you could measure them, would you okay. be able to say something yeah. about quantum gravity in principle? Yeah, I, I, I actually cut this out, but, uh, but I'm glad you said it, because I can now explain. Because you're going to hear more about this, and this is an exciting possibility. Um, the story that the fluctuations that create the large-scale structure that we see today are derived from a sort of hawking light radiation at the epoch of, of inflation applies also to gravitational waves. The ones that make the density fluctuations that we see that make the big clusters and so on, that is what we would call a scalar perturbation to the uniform, a homogeneous universe. The ones that make the gravitational waves are a tensor perturbation. And many theories of inflation, surely the, the simplest ones, predict a small background of tensor waves that will be seen in the sky of the microwave background. And what distinguishes them from the other types of perturbations is essentially a symmetry that is, again, this, I, I, I find this totally distasteful. They're called B modes. And it is, there's some similarity with a, a vector magnetic field, but it's a vector field and it's being used for a scale, for a, for a tensor, for a tensor perturbation. So it shouldn't have been called beam mode. They shouldn't have been called. The simplest thing is just an elastic sh strain. That is what it is closest to. Well, gravitational lens. The same thing happens to gravitational lensing. The distortion of galaxies. That symmetry will not be created by scalar perturbations, but can be created by gravitational waves. That is what many experiments are, they're currently racing each other to try and measure this. And famously, uh, an experiment uh, not so long ago, uh, what called BICEP, claimed to have measured it. And then it was pointed out, it was uh, found, what well, many people are actually, I was skeptical, but people who knew much more about this said, you get that pattern by seeing the radiation through the dusty foreground. And that dusty foreground can also produce these so-called beam wave, beam modes. And that was what they measured, not primordial fluctuations from the epoch of inflation. So they have to eat humble pie, but it hasn't stopped people, uh, it shouldn't have done, doing more sensitive experiments to still try and measure this. If it turns out that nobody measures it, and that you get a lot of exquisite upper limits, which has been quite a common thing to happen in this business. You get exquisite and believable upper limits. That won't by any means rule out inflation because there are many simple variants of the simplest <coughs> model that give you unmeasurably small B modes. Uh, last question, I think I've written this. Yes. Okay, so this is a, book, a bit more of a, a metaphysical point. And, uh, so I, I hope I can, I can comment it. Actually, so the, I, I find like the multiverse uh, picture, the connection of the multiverse picture to the anthropic principle. I don't think that to that that in that sense the multiverse adds very much because the multiverse is still physically constrained by by string theory, right? So the saying, okay, the anthropic principle may determine which 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 of the multiverses we are going to the end, but um, the, the, the amount of multiverses is still is still finite to some extent. So what, what really constrains is constrained by the anthropic principle is the principle with, which gave rate, uh, gave rise to the multiverse in the first place. So I, I don't I, I just it's just a comment. I don't think that the, the multiverse picture adds very very much in, in terms of understanding or 
the anti-atropic principle this time? Um, I'm not sure I agree. The idea of a multiverse is uh, traced by authors. There's a Greek who is credited with, wasn't Christopher, somebody, I can't remember the name, who is credited with having thought these thoughts, and certainly many people over the years have thought about this. It is not the exclusive province of string theory. Now, string theory with counting the number of independent collabi, Gauss spaces and so on is one way defining an ensemble, but it's not the only way of thinking about a multiverse. And the first, you know, the people I know who first went into the anthropic principle, they write huge, wrote huge books on this, as were Carter and going off. He didn't write, Carter didn't write a book, but he developed this idea with Dickey, and then there were huge books written. They had, that was before string theory, so it wasn't, it wasn't a product of string theory. Now, string theory might be a good expression of this, I completely agree, but the idea that the be a sort of plain, I mean, a, a sort of almost infinite uh, ensemble of universes that are causally disconnected from us today, but might some of them will become into our horizon in the very distant future. I think that is is a much older idea. Uh, this business of selecting um, in the modern era goes, I think, back to Robert Dickey in the 1960s. Let's uh, thank Roger again for telling us about the University of Montreal.